jump off in a whole other part of God's Word, and we're going to see how we apply what happened 144 years ago to what's going to happen, what God wants to do today. And this is what the little article said. It was his custom to start each day with prayer and scripture reading, and that morning was no exception. He felt that before attending to the business of his country, first he must attend to the business of his soul. And as he read from God's Word, his heart and eyes were drawn to Psalm 72, verse 8. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Now the 33 fathers of Confederation had gathered in Charlottetown to discuss and draft the terms of the British North America Act. There were many suggestions about what to call this new united Canada. That morning Samuel Leonard Tilley had read from the Bible and became so convinced that Canada should be a nation under God that when he went down to the conference session he presented his suggestion based upon his morning Bible reading, the Dominion of Canada. The other fathers readily agreed and accepted his inspired concept. That all happened, as I mentioned, 144 years ago. And I believe as we sit close to the 144th anniversary of our country, that we need to give dominion back to God. When we talk about the dominion of Canada, people think about a vast section of the North American continent. And they think about the land. They think about the country. But that's not what the Scripture is talking about. What the Scripture is saying is that God will be given the dominion. In other words, Canada is one of the places where God has dominion. By definition, dominion means the power or, and I like this one, right of governing. In other words, we're saying God has the right to govern Canada. It is the right of governing and controlling. It is sovereign authority. I believe that a lot of the difficulty and the stress and the strain and the problems that we face would be overcome if we would give back to God His sovereign authority. Rule and control is another part of the definition. Let God rule. Let God control. And then one of the last definitions is lands or domains subject to sovereignty or control. So the dominion of Canada, if it were to become sub subject to the sovereignty or control of God, would be able to go forward in the will of God, perform the will of God, receive the blessings from God, and we would be dramatically changed. 2 Chronicles 7.14 is a verse that many people would be familiar with. God is speaking to the people of Israel and He is saying, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And, um, well, I'm going to read from the Amplified Version. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek, crave, and require of necessity my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. This is what it is, I believe, in the New International. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It seems to me that one of the things that needs to happen is our land needs to be healed more than in just patching up cracks and things like that. This whole country and this whole nation and everyone in it needs the healing that only God can give. 
When the early church prayed, look in the book of Acts. When the early church prayed, not only was the country changed, but the world was changed. Do you realize that what happened in that little chunk of land down in the Middle East spread to the rest of the world? Now, it's had its challenges. It's had things happen to the Christian faith over the years. But the world as those people knew it, the world as indeed as we know it, is the way it is because of what happened in the early church, because of the faith of the people, the way they reacted to what God was doing and what God had done. Now, one of the things about, I want to mention this, about, about preaching from this pulpit, from this platform, is that when you go to God and you say, what do you want me to do? God comes back, or seems to be doing this lately, comes back with, move on to the next chapter. So we're going to carry on where we left off on Thursday. <laughs> We're going to go to chapter 4 of the book of Acts because we looked at chapter 3 on Thursday. And uh, I'm I'm going to try and get through this as quickly as possible, uh, the the reading, so that... um, But uh, please follow along if you have your Bibles or if you can uh, watch on the screen. The scripture says, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and everyone else in Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you completely healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone." Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Any further threats? After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed, was over 40 years old. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers 
gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Jesus had said to his followers in Matthew 18, 18 to 20, take this most seriously. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. What you say to one another is eternal. I mean this. When two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. And the church believed it and the church did it. When they prayed, God answered. Now let's just back up a little bit and look at what brought all of this distress upon these apostles. Peter and John had healed a man in the temple. Now until now, there had been no opposition to those who were proclaiming Jesus. Perhaps the thought was that if they ignored them, the sect would just kind of fade away. But it was apparent that that wasn't happening. Thousands of people were becoming believers. When Peter and John began preaching in Solomon's porch, the crowds began to listen, and it was time for the authorities to take action. The Sadducees were upset because the disciples were preaching about the resurrection of the dead and the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. It's interesting to note that before the resurrection, it was the Pharisees that were complaining. They were the ones who were in opposition and they were the ones that received the most severe warnings. But after the resurrection, it was the Sadducees who were in opposition. And among the the Pharisees, Of course, there were people like Gamaliel, who he was the guy that stood up and said, well, you know, if this is is not of God, let it be, and it'll fade. But if this is of God, there is absolutely nothing we can do to stop it. Well, he was right. And folks like him and afterwards Paul were inclined to believe. And it was the resurrection that made the difference. Jesus had said he would rise from the dead. And here, we've got an empty tomb. The Sadducees, of course, didn't believe in resurrection, so they had their own theories. So because of this opposition, Peter and John spend the night in prison. They became the first of thousands who have had to endure the bonds of imprisonment, punishment, in some cases, martyrdom for Christ. But I want to ask you, what is most significant? Is it more significant that these two guys went to jail for the night? Or is it perhaps more significant that 5,000 people became believers? Was it worth a night in jail? Now in Acts chapter 4, verses 5 to 7, it says, The next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, By what power or what name did you do this? 
Now you know that Peter and John are going to be really bold in response to this challenge. Peter, probably we would consider the spokesman for the two. It doesn't do any harm to John. Peter was the one that did the talking. And that's the miraculous thing because Peter really got suddenly bold. I wonder if it might have been this reason. When you look at that section of Scripture, look who's in the room. The same two high priests who had tried Jesus are there along with a strong contingent of dependent members of their families who could be trusted to vote along with them. But here you've got these two guys. They're standing, and there is Caiaphas and uh, Annas the high priest. The apostles are looking at substantially the same court which had condemned their Jesus. And they were probably standing in the same hall as they had been standing in when these folks were judging Jesus. They would remember the last time they were together. Can you imagine? You've been through all of that struggle, all of that trial. You've had Jesus crucified. You've had the elation of knowing that he was risen from the dead. But you also have deep down inside the knowledge of what you did the last time that you were either in this room or close to this room. And you remember that Jesus had stood in the place where criminals stand not terribly long before this. The last time that Peter had been in the judgment hall, his courage had faded in the midst of a challenge from a very sharp-tongued maidservant who said, hey, you're, you're one of them. And he denied it. Are you sure you're not with this Jesus fella? Absolutely not. Oh, I could swear you were with them. And Peter responds with a curse and said, I, I don't know the man. And at that moment is fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus had declared to him, you will deny me before the cock crows. He wasn't about to deny Christ this time. Peter wasn't going to let this one go. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had a calmness now that he had not had on the night of betrayal. What those apostles experienced can be repeated today. Any of us can have the same spirit to clothe us with the kind of armor that they had. Acts 4, 18 to 20. I like this. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Great challenge to what the accusers are trying to do. Imagine this. You are presenting to the people the idea that you speak for God. You are the administrators, the ones who have been put in the position to administer God's justice, to administer God's truth. And people have come before you and they have proclaimed the truth of Jesus Christ, that He is the Messiah, that He is the one. And in His name there have been healings. Now here's your challenge. If you speak for God and Peter claims that he is following God by refusing unlawful obedience, who's right? Obviously, these folks sat back and began thinking. Those in the council had to judge whether they were speaking for God or whether Peter and John were the true spokespeople. 
was this kangaroo court, essentially, the way it was set up, the true um, administrator of God's justice? Or was it perhaps true that Peter and John were on the right track? What was the evidence that Caiaphas and Annas had? And what was the evidence that Peter and John could present? Peter speaks of the limits of obedience to civil authority. There comes a time when God has to have the precedence over everything. And so he says, I've got to do what God says. And I have to speak. You can't make me stop because God's given me the word to speak and I have to speak the word. Speak to anybody, talk to anybody who has ever been commissioned by God to speak his word. And you will get pretty much the same response. I can't not preach. And let me speak to you from experience. I tried it of necessity. There was, as you've heard, there was a a church at one time who was not willing to let God have control. They were not willing to be told that they couldn't have their own way, but God had to have his way. And so I had a member of the board sit in my room, in my living room, and tell me, um, we're, we're amalgamating with another church, and we're going to take the other, the other guy. And I thought, well, I've got time to write books, to write my books. And it didn't take more than a week, and I couldn't not preach. And I went looking for a place to preach. And as it was, we were able to spend about three years um, blessing people that couldn't get out to church but were in um, seniors' residences. So Peter says, I can't obey you. I've got to do what God tells me to do. And I can't stop speaking because that's what God has put within me. Somebody has said, and I think it relates well to this experience that the apostles had, the church is an anvil which has worn out many hammers. There are always forces that will beat against the church and try to shape it into what the world would like. And the church stands strong and the hammer has to quit. And you need, you know, people discover they have to have another hammer. Okay, so now I'm getting ready to preach because that was just background so that you know where we're going from here. Acts chapter 4, verse 23 On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. What better response to a challenge to faith than to seek out the strength of other Christian believers, than to go and seek Christian fellowship? Here they'd been through all of this trial and trouble and tribulation. What did they do? They went back to the church because that's where they knew the support would come. And I want to suggest to you today that if the church is going to go somewhere, it needs to go there together. If you had been here Wednesday, we talked about going somewhere as the church together. Not just us together. We're not talking about let's get another big bus and go someplace. But we're talking about the church, meaning the fellowship of the faithful of God, going together. This church and every other church in this community working together to bring about what God wants to do in this place, in this province, in this country, and around the world. And if we cannot do it together, let me venture to suggest we can't do it 
What we need to do is we need, like these disciples, these followers of Jesus, is we need to pray with one voice. We need to recognize the sovereignty of God. We need to rely on the Word of God. And probably most important, in order for the church to demonstrate to the world that it means business, we need to expect results. Let me briefly cover the first three and then lay it on the line and Part four here. First of all, we need to pray with one voice. What happened after Peter and John were challenged? When they heard this, or at least after the people heard that Peter and John had been challenged, the Scripture says in verse 24, When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. We can just leave that up because I'm coming back to it. These believers were not divided. They heard what the challenge was. They heard what was coming against the church. And they got together and they all agreed together. Now I want you to dig down in your deepest heart of hearts. You have been convinced by God that what you are saying and doing is absolutely correct. You have healed in Jesus' name. You have proclaimed God's purposes in Jesus' name. You have spoken to people uh, who did not know what God was capable of doing, and they have responded 5,000 on this one occasion. And people have taken you, they've thrown you in jail, they've challenged you, they've told you you can't do this anymore. The human response would be, I'm going to take revenge. I'm going to go to the post office and put up posters. I'm going to put an ad in the newspaper. These people aren't going to get away with this. I'm going to get a little group together and we're going to go and we're going to throw chairs through their windows. What happens in this particular case. They go and they pray. There is no plan for revenge or rebellion. They pray to God. They say, God, help us to be more bold. Help us to be louder and more Uh, enthusiastic than we've been before. Help us to get out and proclaim the message better than we ever have before. They recognize the sovereignty of God. I've said this before. You've heard it before. There is a God. You're not Him. Neither am I. Jesus is Lord. They pray, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. If he is to have dominion, in other words, if he's to have lordship, if he's to have command, if he's to have control, then we can't demand to have dominion. We can't say, I want it my way. We can't be overly upset when it doesn't go our way. We have to let go of our desire to be in control. We have to settle it in our mind that we can never have our way ever again. Now that sounds scary, and when it's been mentioned to other people, it has just frightened the living daylights out of them. What would happen if I let go and let God? What would happen? What would happen in my life? And people get, you know, if I can't do that, what am I going to do? If I can't have my own way, I'd lose control. Precisely. (laughs) precisely, you would lose control and you wouldn't have to worry about it ever again. 
You know, that, that one situation that I always talk about where I said to the congregation, you know, you're, you're not allowed to... What if you never had your way ever again? When the fear was overcome, there were f- wonderful things that were happening in individuals' lives and within the church. But the moment they thought a deadline had been reached and it was time to, okay, we've got to take control back, things stopped happening. The coincidences that had been taking place before just weren't taking place anymore. So we need to pray with one voice together, agree that what the Bible says is true as far as prayer is concerned, recognize the sovereignty of God, that we don't have any control and we shouldn't demand any control. Because he knows what we need far better than we ever will. And then we need to rely on the word of God. And I want you to notice what goes on here. They're praying to God and they're saying, Lord, you know, we, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They're demonstrating their reliance on the word of God with these words. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. They're not saying, Lord, we believe because you healed people. We believe because 5,000 people joined. They're saying, we believe because sometimes things don't go right and you said that that was true. You said that the nations are going to rage, the people are going to plot, and their plotting is going to be in vain. That's one good point. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against the anointed one. Here they are in the midst of that situation. They're saying, you're right. We've just experienced that. There's no doubt. There's no criticism. There's no interpretation Well, you know, David said this. That's really not what he meant, you know, because he was talking about something that that, uh, related to his time in history. And, of course, that's come and gone, so we can't look at that anymore, is basically what a lot of people would say. What these apostles are saying is, God said it, that settles it. And I believe it. If you doubt the Word of God, you won't use it. If you doubt any part of the Word of God, you won't use it. If you divide it, how are you going to decide which parts are reliable? Believe it or you will be forever hungry. Let me assure you of that. You will be forever hungry, not for food, but for something from God. If we start saying the Bible contains the Word of God, but it contains other stuff as well, where are you going to stop saying, well, that's other stuff? How well do we know the Word of God? We have to become familiar, really familiar with the Word of God. And I will confess I'm not as familiar as I would like to be. But here's a story that a friend, a close friend of mine told a number of years ago about uh, a situation where Scripture was to be used, where there was question about Scripture. And I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but how hard you laugh at this will depend on how well you know Scripture. I think, I think that's safe to say. This was a recent graduate from seminary who was being interviewed by the Personnel Committee. And he was asked, what part of the Bible do you like best? And he answered, well, sir, I like the New Testament. One point. And the chairman said, well, what book in the New Testament? Well, said the candidate, I think I like the book of parables. Another man said, well, will you kindly relate one of those parables to this committee? So the young graduate knew what he was up against, and um, he began this way. 
I especially like the parable where the man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked the man black and blue. And he reached out and took the jawbone of a donkey and beat his way out of the thorns. He jumped on the mule and headed for Jericho. And when he was driving along under a tree of many branches, his hair got all caught up in a limb and left him hanging there. He hung there 40 days and 40 nights. And the ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink. And one night when he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah came along and cut his hair. Whack! He fell on stony ground. And it began to rain. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. And he hid himself in a cave. And he went on and didn't have any money. And then he met the queen of Sheba and she gave him gave that man a thousand talents of gold and silver and a hundred changes of raiments. And the man went out into the highways and byways and compelled them all to come in. Then he came up to Jericho and looked up and said, Who is on the Lord's side? And he saw Queen Jezebel sitting high up in a window. And when she saw him, she laughed at him. So he said, Throw her down. They threw her down. He said, Throw her down again. They threw her down again. Seventy times seven, they threw her down. And when they picked up the fragments, there were twelve baskets full. (laughs) Now I ask you, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? I'm so happy for many of you that you all laughed. We've got to know the Word of God for more than just that sort of thing. Acts chapter 4, verse 27 and 28 indicates that these apostles understood that what had happened was God's plan and purpose. They had read the Word of God. They had seen the prophecies. They understood that challenges would come. And they said, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. The apostles are using this as their reason to believe. They are looking even to the things that are hurtful and sad and wrong that God said would happen as the stepping stone to their request for help in what lay ahead. We need to be that confident in God's plan regardless of what we see and what we experience. Now finally I said we want to expect results. I suspect, shouldn't say I suspect, I truly and earnestly believe that in the weeks and the months to come we are going to see such a changing time in this congregation, in this community, and in this province that We cannot, at this point where we stand, even imagine what is going to happen. We need, though, to expect results. And so these apostles, they went to God and they said, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They're not just saying, and the Scripture is not just saying, you must see it to believe it. The Scripture says, you've got to believe it if you want to see it. There is more 
in this world than mankind can accomplish. We can't limit God to our capabilities. Just because you or I say, I can't do it, doesn't mean it can't be done. People will say, I don't know why you pray like you do in church. I, I can't heal people. Okay, what's your point? None of us can heal people. But God can. God works through us. We can pray. We can lay hands on people. We can ask God to answer. And I want to venture to say that if we can, with all of our hearts and souls, believe that God will answer, God will answer. The problem is that we look at what God is not doing. I've got a book that I've just been reading lately called The Man in the Third Cell. It's a short little book, really, really short, about the imprisonment of John. Consider this. John has been told all of the things that Jesus is doing. John is confident that he has been broadcasting the truth about God. And John is in jail. And John is going to lose his head. And Jesus is not going to do anything about it. If we concentrate on that, we miss out on the fact that the gospel is spreading. Jesus is doing what he is prophesied to do. Healings are taking place. People are learning about the love of God. We can spend all of our time questioning why did God do that? But as you and I well know, we have decided we don't ask those questions anymore. We go with what God has told us we must do under the assurance of what God has said He will do. Instead of praying for an open heaven, we should be praying as if we already had an open heaven. Because of the truth of the matter is, we do. The early church received what they expected. They received exactly what they asked for. The scripture says, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And then they went out and great things happened in the church. You and I can get our joy from a number of different roots. We can listen to great stories from other churches in other places and say, that just lifts my heart to the heavens. That is just great. That church down in the United States, they're experiencing wonderful things. I'm just so blessed. That church up in Saskatoon is doing wonderful things. I'm just so blessed to know that that's happening. But wouldn't it be better if it were happening right here? Would you not feel energized to go out, not just outside the wall, but to go wherever you went and proclaim God heals, God raises the dead? God wants to do good things in people's lives. We need a testimony of our own. I had a friend, I have a friend, who said, you know, if your testimony is more than 24 hours old, you're just not living close enough to God. If God's not doing things in our lives that we can give testimony to, then we're not standing close enough to our Father in heaven. We need to be able to share what God is doing among us. The problem is we don't seem to believe that what Jesus said we could do can be done. And it puts a stop to God's ability 
not to God's ability, but to, to God's response. We're not expecting it. And so heaven somehow closes down for us. The Holy Spirit is imprisoned within unbelieving believers. Oh yes, I believe. I believe what it says in there. In the sense that I believe it's written down, I believe it's the Word of God. But you have to go one step further and say, I believe that that Word of God will take place. That when I pray for healing, it will happen. That when I pray for the dead to be raised, it will happen. If the Holy Spirit is imprisoned within unbelieving believers, then we got to let him out. Here would be a good test, that we're doing what we ought to be doing, and we're doing it on a day-to-day basis. Bring testimonies from outside the church. Come back from your trip to Moose Jaw and say, I was in Walmart and there was someone there who was walking with a cane or a walker or was in a wheelchair and I just went over and said, heal this person. And they stood up and they walked out pushing their wheelchair. Don't know who they were. Didn't bother to ask. They were so excited they didn't bother to stop and tell me who they were. That is what God wants to do. Remember, most of Jesus' miracles were performed for non-church people. The church people were the ones that, <laughs> that were causing the problem. I wonder if we've inherited some of that. As Christians, I think we should be expected to have an appetite for the impossible. We've got a God who does things that everybody else say, says are impossible. But they happen. And we know that they happen in some places today. We know they've happened here. But they should happen more times than not. One of the major functions of miracles and supernatural living is to offer immediate, irrefutable proof that what God uh, of what God wants to happen on earth. Okay? Miracles and supernatural living demonstrates to the rest of the world what God wants to see happen on the world. It demonstrates who God is by showing what His reality looks like. And this is what Paul said. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A gospel of power without seeing that power is very tiresome. And people will draw away. We attempt to carry out the Great Commission without offering proof that the kingdom works. Why would you want to go, well, you might want to go and make disciples, but why would people want to be disciples if you can't prove that there's some real good reason for that? Bill Johnson says, too many of us have been like a vacuum cleaner salesman who comes to the door and throws a handful of dirt on the floor and says, I represent the new whiz-bang vacuum cleaner company. My vacuum cleaner is so strong that you have to remove pets and children from the room. It sucks up everything in sight. But instead of demonstrating the vacuum cleaner, he simply hands you a brochure, and for Christians that would be a tract, promises that the machine will work and then walks away. That's cheating. If it's true that it works, prove it. Demonstrate it. Many a vacuum cleaner has not been sold because it didn't work, but at least the guy tried. If we want to, in essence, sell people on the idea that God is God and that what he says in his word is true, then we should be able to prove it. We deny the power of prayer because we don't practice it. 
It's safe, you know, to pray for believers because they love you. They'll let it go if nothing happens. But should we ever do that? It's not the will of God that we do not see miracles. The problem is we can't get our minds around the fact that God wants to do all this still today. We're not desperate enough for God. We're not desperate enough for Him to have dominion over us. But let me suggest that that can all change. God promised power to His people. We need to put all of our faith behind that. Powerlessness is inexcusable from God's perspective. Powerlessness is inexcusable. The question is, consider this. I've asked the question before, but think about it deeply. If you were arrested for being a believing Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Let me give you an example of how things get a little twisted out of shape. I am drawing quickly to a close. Consider this two sides of the story sort of thing. Try and understand. In a Kentucky town, there were two churches and one distillery. The distillery was owned by an atheist. The churches gathered one night to pray that the distillery would close. A violent storm came and lightning destroyed the distillery. Got it? Atheist owns the distillery. Churches pray, Lord, close the distillery. Distillery gets closed by a storm, destroys the building. The churches were happy. The atheist was angry. The insurance company refused to pay for what it called an act of God. Now then, the atheist sued the churches. The churches claimed that they weren't responsible. Think about it. We're not responsible. The judge was in a quandary. He said, this is the most perplexing case I have ever overseen because on the one hand, I have an atheist who believes in the power of prayer and on the other hand, I have two churches that deny it. What are we expecting? You know, if we pray and God answers, give God the glory pay the consequences. If God's going to have dominion over our country, He must first be given dominion over our lives. His power must dominate our thinking. We must resolve to come to Him daily in prayer. We must resolve to come to Him daily to study His Word. We need to pray for doubters. We need to pray for those who deny the power of God. We need to pray for our country so that the control will be passed back to God. We cannot say He shall have dominion from sea to sea if we're not going to let Him have dominion from sea to sea. As we said a few days ago, Thursday night. We want him lifted higher. That means we must place him at the uppermost level of our lives and nothing can be allowed to displace him. He has to have dominion here in our hearts and here in our heads. And then, once that happens, he will have dominion, not just from sea to sea, but all over his creation. We must allow God, I hope that, that might be him. <laughs> <laughs>
we must allow God to be God. We must allow him to have dominion over us. He must have the control. Too often, what you and I say and do is we say, I believe. I'll go to church. I'll pray for the sick people. I'll pray for those in need. I will pray for all of the requests that come in. But I'll be satisfied if nobody laughs in my face. I'll be satisfied if I can say to people, can I pray for you, and they don't say no. We need to be not satisfied until when we pray, we see the results. Let's not look at the times when it doesn't happen. Let's remember the times when it does happen and replicate that particular level of faith that brought about the healing, that brought about the change in the situation we were facing. God's going to have dominion from sea to sea one day. I would like it to happen in my generation and in your generation and in the generation of the young people that we see among us. But it's not going to happen if we're constantly drawing back and saying, God's asking too much. God's got too much control. I've got to have a little bit more flexibility to be what I want to be. He must have dominion in us if he's going to have dominion anywhere. He must have dominion in us if he's going to have dominion anywhere.